Welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'm Hallie Nicholson, HR Strategic Communication and Engagement Manager, and I'll be your moderator for this town hall. It's great to be here together this afternoon. We've got a great group of panelists with us today to provide some updates on our operations during the COVID-19 pandemic and to answer questions about topics that are important to staff. Some of the questions were submitted during registration and you can also feel free to use the Q&A window to submit additional questions for our panelists. We've got panelists behind the scenes as well answering questions in writing, so I do encourage you to check out that Q&A box. Due to our time limitation, we won't be able to get to all your questions, but we will log the questions as they uh, come in and post the answers on our Return to Learn website. This webinar has live closed captioning in two ways. First, you can click on the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen and select show subtitles, or you can also click on the link that will be pasted into the chat. So now I'd like to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Chip Schooley, Professor of Medicine, who's going to give us an update on the medical side of things of COVID-19. So take it away, Chip. Thanks very much, Ellie, and welcome everybody. It's good to be back with you today. I'm gonna to try over the next uh, couple of minutes just to give a brief update, and we'll have some time for question and answers later. Uh, I think as everyone has been seeing, we're uh, uh, seeing the current wave of um, mainly the Delta variant in the US declining. Uh, we've uh, been on the downswing now for about two weeks or so. Uh, and I think are headed uh, in the right direction, particularly here, next slide, in California. You can see that if you look at California, uh, we never really had the types of peaks that were seen in the, U in the southeastern US. And uh, even from the modest peak we had, we're seeing things uh, improve throughout most of California, particularly here, uh, as I'll show you in the San Diego region. Next slide. There are still some issues with children. Uh, we've had the largest wave of pediatric infections since the beginning of the epidemic uh, over the course of the last month and a half. Uh, much of this has been driven by um, schools reopening, uh, particularly in the Southeast over the last uh, six weeks uh, where masks were not required in several of the key states. This fortunately is getting better as well uh, as uh, masking mandates are being come in place uh, and some of the other school systems are opening uh, in other parts of the country with, uh, with mask mandates. Next slide. In San Diego, uh, things are uh, continuing to improve. You can see in the upper left panel that the number of cases has been declining uh, for about four weeks. Uh, and we're now down to a case rate that looks very much like the, uh, what we were seeing toward the end of April. Uh, and the number of hospitalizations, uh, which often follows uh, the case rate a bit, uh, is also declining very uh, nicely, both here uh, at UC San Diego and throughout the county. If you look in the lower right-hand panel, you can see though that there's a continues to be this dichotomy in terms of uh, the characteristics of people who are in the hospital. You can see that of, at UC San Diego Health yesterday morning, we had 54 people in the hospital. 46 of these uh, were people who had not been vaccinated. Eight were fully vaccinated. Several of them had other conditions uh, that contributed to their hospitalization. But if you look in the intensive care unit, uh, all of the patients in the ICU uh, were among the non-vaccinated population. So what we're continuing to see is the severe disease uh, accumulating uh, in people uh, who have not been vaccinated. Uh, next slide. And to show you what's going on on campus, if you just focus on the uh, middle panel, you can see that uh, we are having generally a pretty good uh, uh, situation as uh, our students arrive back on campus. We uh, put 13,000 students, um, or a little over 12,000 students in beds and had a campus positivity rate of 0.1%. Uh, you'll hear a little bit more about this from Dr. Socher who follows me. The campus employee case rate is also quite low, which is very uh, reassuring and a very happy, no cases at all. Um, day before yesterday to give you a sense of, of how things are quieting down here as well. Next slide. Now, why are things getting better? Uh, a lot of it is that uh, in other parts of the country, people who had kind of resumed activities uh, indoors and uh, in places where the um, transmission rate was high, backed off a bit uh, and began to mask indoors and in crowded outdoor situations. Uh, and uh, workplaces have gotten better at uh, helping identify people through screening and isolating them and quarantining their, their uh, contacts uh, until the incubation period is over. But the most important thing has been we're gradually seeing an increasing level of immunity in our populations at risk. More people have been infected in the past, but more importantly, uh, we have an increasing vaccination rate. Next slide. 
particularly here in San Diego, you can see that we're close to 90% of San Diegans have uh, over the age of 12 have had at least one of their uh, vaccine uh, and, uh, shots. Uh, and you can see that uh, a little over three quarters of, have gotten, uh, have already had two of them. Uh, when you look on campus, our students are coming in uh, above 90% have gotten started. You'll hear a bit more about um, uh, this uh, situation from Dr. Sosha uh, in a minute or two, but we're very happy with how our students are coming in. Uh, we think there'll be uh, several points higher as we some of the records get reconciled. Uh, on the Health Sciences campus, uh, we're in the close to 95% of our employees have been vaccinated. As you know, there's a state mandate that goes into effect later this week. You'll hear more about that for health science employees uh, by the CDPH, the Department of Health, which requires vaccination or an exemption. Campus employees uh, are under the UC San Diego uh, um, mandate, which is coming along as well. You'll, again, you have more about this from uh, Terry Winbush, but you can see that uh, our employees are doing well as well with about 90% of them started and 98% fully vaccinated. Next slide, please. Now to, to get to the kind of discussion of the day, booster shots, uh, what's going on here? Well, what we're seeing right now is that the three vaccines in use are doing a pretty good job of keeping people out of the hospital uh, and preventing deaths. Uh, we're seeing a fair number of breakthrough infections. Uh, we're seeing more breakthrough infections uh, in uh, people who received the Pfizer vaccine uh, than the Moderna vaccine. And that's uh, perhaps because uh, the Pfizer vaccine was given a bit earlier, perhaps because it was given three weeks apart instead of four weeks apart. But the bottom line is we're seeing more of an erosion in the Pfizer immunity from the standpoint of breakthrough cases uh, than we are in the Moderna um, situation. We had fewer people um, vaccinated with Johnson & Johnson, but we think we're going to see more breakthrough infections with it coming along as well. A lot of discussions have gone on about booster shots. Uh, why do we want to uh, boost people? Obviously, we want to uh, do as much as we can to reduce morbidity and mortality. Um, people who are immunocompromised, transplant patients and others have been uh, offered booster shots for some time now, third vaccine, and many of them seems to provide quite a bit more protection. We also want to decrease transmission so that few, fewer people transmit virus uh, to, uninfect, to unvaccinated people uh, at home and their families uh, and, uh, and, uh, and out and about. Uh, there was long discussion about this at the uh, FDA that we'll discuss in, and at the uh, CDC that we'll discuss in a minute. But the bottom line is I think uh, boosters are uh, going to be picking up steam over the course of the next few months to try to keep us ahead of having uh, waning immunity get us in trouble. Now, next slide. Uh, what about this issue of booster shots? Uh, this just shows you the uh, schedule of Pfizer and Moderna and Johnson & Johnson vaccines, uh, weeks zero and three were the Pfizer vaccine, zero and four the Moderna vaccine, and there was only one shot given for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Normally, uh, our primary booster ser our, our, uh, vaccination series for many of our diseases uh, are given uh, zero weeks, four weeks, and then 16 or 20 weeks later. We didn't do that with these with this particular virus, and it was mainly because I think we didn't spend a year and a half or two years trying to sort out the perfect schedule because of the emergency that was underway last fall when uh, this was all uh, happening. But it's clear now that this vaccine as well needs that delayed booster shot just like others do, and we're headed in the direction, uh, as I said, for boosters. Next slide. As you saw the last few days, uh, there has been an ongoing discussion uh, in the late stages of the booster shots related to the Pfizer vaccine in particular, because it's the only one um, that uh, has been far enough along uh, to get to the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practice, the ACIP, at the CDC. The steps that uh, vaccine manufacturers have to go through are to first finish their studies, then they show their studies to the FDA. The FDA has a group um, called CBER that evaluates it. They have an outside committee called VRPAC that then gives them advice to the FDA commissioner, who then decides whether or not a vaccine should be approved for the indications that the manufacturer requests. In the case of the Pfizer vaccine, uh, Pfizer asks that anybody over the age of 16 should be allowed to have a booster shot. After going through the FDA process, the FDA commissioner said um, that uh, she thought that the vaccine should be available to people over the age of 65, people with underlying conditions themselves, and people who were in jobs or work situations in which 
they would be in contact with people at uh, significant risk, which would be healthcare workers and teachers. It then went from there to the CDC. Their outside committee was much more conservative and did not recommend vaccination of healthcare workers or teachers. But uh, Dr. Rochelle Walensky, who um, had recently been the head of infectious diseases at, the infectious, uh, at uh, Mass General and understood the problems with breakthrough infections, the impact on the workplace, and understood the trends and things, reversed that decision, and the CDC has approved the uh, vaccine the same way the FDA did. Next slide. So where are we now in terms of timelines? Uh, we're now in a stage where we're going to be offering booster uh, vaccinations to people uh, over the age of 65 and those who are either at risk themselves or in at-risk at conditions if you receive the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, those of you who get your health care at UC San Diego Health and fit the medical conditions will be uh, can schedule through uh, my chart. Uh, there'll be more details later about some of the other uh, boosting for employees uh, who meet other criteria. Today, uh, the Pfizer vaccine for children uh, was submitted to the FDA. Uh, I expect we'll hear from the FDA about uh, children 5 to 11 sometime by the end of next month. Uh, booster shots for those over 16 are a little bit further out with the fact that Pfizer vaccine, not completely clear when this will be. It may be closer to the end of the year. A lot of the research is now well underway for children 2 to 5. Uh, and again, I'd not be surprised to see uh, these boosters, uh, these uh, vaccines available by the end of the year. Children are getting smaller doses of the Pfizer vaccine, about a third of the dose uh, given to children 5 to 11, and the tolerability has been quite good, as has been the immunogenicity. The Moderna vaccine is holding up a bit better, uh, and so there's less urgency in getting the boosters going. Moderna has uh, also done their uh, booster research, and in their case, they're recommending the booster shots be half the dose uh, of the initial two vaccinations. And I think you'll see them coming along sometime in the middle of October or later uh, before the uh, middle of November uh, with the same kind of booster recommendations as Pfizer, children a bit further along, and J&J &J is a bit behind uh, the other two. So I'm going to stop now and turn this back over to my colleagues and look forward to interacting with you all with questions later. All right. Thanks a bunch, Chip. Always great to hear from you. All right, so for our next update, we're going to hear about some campus health and safety guidelines from Dr. Angela Sosha, Interim Executive Director of Student Health and Wellbeing and Chair of the Vaccination Mandate Workgroup. So Angela, take it away. Hi, and thanks, Hal, and good afternoon, everyone. So we have some new updates that reflect a lot of activity, including what's been going on with the mandate, as well as taking into account the Delta variant, which is the virus that is circulating in San Diego and has a more rapid transmission, and we know we have some breakthrough cases. You're going to see we have um, some changes in policy. So we're going to review all of that this afternoon. So the mandate, the mandate basically is asking all UCOP individuals, students, faculty, and staff to be fully vaccinated, which means you've completed your series, does not take into account boosters at this point. So boosters are not part of the mandate. Fully vaccinated two weeks after you complete your series or an approved exemption. And these include medical, disability, religious, as well as a deferral for pregnancy. The uh, CDPH has, as Chip mentioned, made a additional mandate for healthcare workers that they be fully vaccinated or meet some exemptions. They have a more restrictive exemption criteria. They do not recommend or allow, they do not allow a deferral for pregnancy. And as we heard at the last town hall, it is actually encouraged that pregnant women do vaccinate. There are some health benefits to it. Uh, they also do not uh, have an exemption for recent COVID infections or a positive antibody. There, so there are more restrictions on the CDPH requirement for healthcare workers that does go into effect. You saw the numbers were doing very well in all of our populations with a large percent being uh, vaccinated as well as then a few percent meeting the criteria for the exemptions. And we are reaching out to anybody in the gap. Why do we still have a gap? There are actually some challenges in the data. It can be tricky. The students are gradually enrolling and enrollment has gone up as students pay their fees. Um, we have employees who um, sever and terminate. We have retirees. There are a lot of different categories, but as best we can, we're working through all of that. 
Also, employees have to consent. So we've seen frequently employees, we have evidence in their employee health record that they have been vaccinated, but they've not done the two-step of review and consent and submit the approval to share that vaccine to meet the mandate. So please, if you haven't done that, uh, please do that. So we're working on that as well. And then we have the international vaccines for our students generally, which are a little more complex to review and then approve meeting the criteria. And we do offer some supplemental vaccination because some of the international vaccines are not as protective. Vaccination is still available for primary vaccination at the Price Center for both employees and students. We're not doing boosters at the Price Center, but if you meet the criteria and you are a UC San Diego uh, a patient, you should have actually gotten a message. It's very easy. I met criteria by age and my employment and I got my vaccine in the Athena Center. It's drive up, super easy. Their appointments are available if you meet the criteria. I think there is a little confusion about the education. My understanding, and Chip will certainly correct me if I've got this wrong, is it's been for younger educators, not for higher ed educators. They have not been brought under the Pfizer WHO at this point. I think things will expand and more uh, uh, populations will be allowed uh, to have access to booster with time. Um, and it's possible we'll have it on campus, but right now the easiest way to get a booster if you meet criteria is gonna be in the health system that you receive your care. Next slide. And also a comment, flu vaccine is widely available. We do not yet have an official mandate. Um, we anticipate it may come and it will likely be a self attestation. I would take advantage of flu vaccine. You can get it at any pharmacy and your healthcare providers. At the Price Center, we're offering it for students. We are hoping to get an allocation for employees, but that may not occur for a few weeks. So I wouldn't delay waiting for the Price Center access. Take advantage of it throughout the community. Lots of flu vaccine around. Next slide. The, oh, sorry, let me cover this. If you do have an approved exemption or you're not yet fully vaccinated, maybe you've only gotten your first dose and not completed your series, you need to follow as part of the mandate, the non-pharmaceutical interventions, which are basically testing and masking. And I'll be describing that in quite a bit of detail. The testing for the unvaccinated community throughout the fall quarter will be twice a week. So that's surveillance testing. If you are unvaccinated, it is required of employees as well as students. You remember last year, employees were encouraged but not required. Under the mandate, unvaccinated employees are required to test twice a week if they are coming onto campus. Next slide. So we've had some changes in the exposure guidance and this is very important for employment. Um, it's partly related to the duration of quarantine because Delta tends to have an onset that is sooner. And so people convert and we want to pick up conversions fairly soon. So if you are an unvaccinated individual and you have been notified by public health, either our own team or the county's team or another provider has told you that you meet criteria, it's not a self-definition that you have been exposed and you're unvaccinated, you need to remain off campus. If you're a residential student living with other non-family members, you'll be moved to quarantine housing. Um, you need to test upon notification and then get a day five test post-exposure. Post if those two tests are negative and you monitor your symptoms throughout this period, a period of seven days, then you have completed that quarantine. Keep monitoring your symptoms. Everybody should do daily symptom monitoring. That's part of our normal life now. If you're an employee though, that period of quarantine for work function is extended to 10 days. So Cal OSHA does not allow unvaccinated employees after an exposure to return to work until a full 10 day period and no development of symptoms. If you're a vaccinated employee, now you are allowed to actually continue to work even though you've been exposed. This is something the healthcare workers have been doing um, through a large part of the pandemic. If you don't have symptoms and you've been fully vaccinated, 
you are allowed to continue to work, but we are adding some added safety precautions. In addition to the regular indoor masking, if you've been exposed, we want you to mask at all times, including outdoor spaces. When you eat, please eat alone. Residential students who have a roommate, because because we have doubles, if they have a, an individual they're sharing a room with because they don't mask at night to sleep, they are being moved to quarantine housing. But they are able to actually come back and do classes. They are able to, as student employees to work. This is if you've been vaccinated and you have no symptoms, you still need to test on notification of exposure in day five. And that period of monitoring, again, very strict monitoring goes for 10 days as an employee. So changes in the quarantine process uh, this fall. Next slide. So masking, just to remind everybody, regardless of your vaccination, we are in indoor masking, except if you're in a personal enclosed office by yourself and you've not been exposed. There's no eating or drinking um, in the common indoor areas. You are allowed to do that again if you are by yourself only in your enclosed personal office. Outdoors, we encourage everyone to mask in crowded situations. And remember the exposed vaccinated employees and students need to be masked for that period of time. Students living on campus, we had a great move in as Dr. Scully mentioned to you, over 12,000 students moved in over a 10 day period. Anybody on campus had to be aware of this incredibly exciting period. They did a great job. There were only 13 students who arrived un aware of an infection, uh, asymptomatic students picked up very quickly and moved to isolation housing. That positivity rate of 0 0.1 is substantially less than we expected and better than many sister campuses in uh, the system. So they've done great. They continue to mask in their common areas, but they don't need to mask in their bedroom or when they shower. In a couple of weeks, if things are looking really good, we will allow them to start not having to mask in their residential units. This just gives them a little more normal life experience like we are doing in our homes. Most of us are not masking in our homes. It's an easier way to live. It's a more normal way to live. Um, so they also are not visiting between units. The, the student behavior has been very good on campus and we're really excited about the way things have started out. Next slide. So masking, just a reminder, uh, a mask is not a scarf or a bandana. It's not a ski mask or gator or a collar. It's not putting your arm in front of your face when you walk by someone. It's also not the shields. The shields do not alone work as a good mask. A mask needs to cover both your nose and your mouth. It needs to be tightly fitting. We're recommending N95s or KN95s or a, multi a surgical mask or multi-layer cloth mask. But again, what's important is the tight fit around your face, okay? And that um, you tighten it up around the nose. This is an important part, no gaps on the side. Some folks like to put a surgical mask followed by a cloth mask over it. That works really well as well. And then you can readily get the KN95s and the N95s and we're making those available to campus employees. Next slide. Testing. So, there are certain things regardless of your vaccination status. If you have the new onset of symptoms, we're gonna recommend that you get a test. Remember the campus has provided free testing and access to testing to make it really easy for our employees and our community to test. Wastewater. If there is a wastewater signal in a building that you work in, we encourage you to test. For our residential students, if they're living in a building with a wastewater signal, we're requiring them to test within 48 hours. And again, if you've been notified that you've had an exposure, a close contact with someone who is positive, you should test, test when you're notified and then on day five. Unvaccinated individuals throughout the fall quarter will have surveillance. That means no symptoms, just you, you test consistently twice a week. No less than three days, no more than five days apart. So for the fall quarter, if you are an unvaccinated individual or partially vaccinated, twice a week testing. If you're a vaccinated individual, for the students for the first four weeks, we're requiring you to test if you're coming to campus. And we're encouraging our employees to do the same thing. 
This will give us a very good feel if we're have seeing any asymptomatic shedding of virus, if there's more virus than we're able to see based on other criteria. So after four weeks, we're gonna reassess things. So keep your eyes open for another update at the next town hall. And please take advantage of all the testing. I wanna remind, next slide. Uh, we'll get there. Oh, before we get the, the uh, vending machines, I want to remind folks about the daily screening. We are going to do an update. It's going to take us about two weeks to get all the infrastructure built. We're going to simplify the thumb process so that when you do your daily screen, it'll be very similar to what you're doing when you log in. You'll answer the same questions about exposure and symptoms. But we're also going to integrate information about testing requirements for unvaccinated, we're going to bring all of that together and create a very simplified symbol. Green, you're allowed on campus. Yellow, you're allowed on campus, but you need to do that continuous outdoor masking and you need to eat alone. Or red, you're not allowed on campus. And that could be a variety of reasons. You're not following the testing requirements that are present. You are develop some new symptoms. These are things that could give you a red thumb. So you will see this new form of the thumb coming out in a couple of weeks. We think this will make it easier for everyone. Next slide. Um, remember the wastewater signals on the return to learn dashboard. You can see any building that you work in, you'll be able to tell if there's been a recent signal. If there has been, please test. You also may be receiving the targeted messages when we have wastewater signals. Next slide. And the vending machines. So vending machines process has worked extremely well. Employees for your very first COVID test that cannot be through a vending machine, can be at the price center or drive up, site in the health system. If you've ever had that done once, you're in the system, you can then go on and use the vending machines. You do need your campus ID to release a kit. The kit is then released from the machine. There is a dollar on dollar off. So it'll look like a dollar, but it comes right off behind the scenes. So no cost. And the kit will contain everything you need. It'll have instructions, a swab, and a testing vial. What's really important is we have to identify that test to you. And we do this through the UCSD app. On the UCSD app, you go in with your AD logon and you scan a barcode on the vial just like all the barcodes we're used to in our grocery stores and everywhere else in our world. You scan that vial on your phone. It will link to you because you've been logged in as you through the app. You'll see that it's captured the barcode. Make sure you capture the barcode. And then that vial is now linked to you. After you've swabbed, you drop it into the collection bin. We just need the vial dropped in. Please return the clamshell because we recycle those. You should get your results within 24 hours. If you don't get a result, please retest. Every once in a while, we have a slip in the barcode capture. Every once in a while, someone, make sure you do seal the vial. Sometimes somebody doesn't seal the vial and the media leaks out. We also have occasionally seen someone put the swab in upside down. Make sure the tip that you swab your nose goes in first so it's sitting in the media. But for sometimes there can be a loss of a sample or something odd. It's very rare. We do thousands of samples and it's unusual for us not to get a result. But if you don't have a result in your my chart within 24 hours, please retest. And if you're still not seeing it, call the COVID testing line or call student health if you're a student. The vending machines are in 20 locations throughout campus with two drive ups, um, one at Osler. And I think by the end of this week, there'll be also the North Torrey Pines. So uh, make sure you do the swabbing. The pickups end after 2 p.m. So please get it in early in the day so we can get results either back that evening or early the next morning. Next slide. Just again, a reminder, you do wanna load uh, your UCSD app on there. You have to make sure you capture the barcode um, on that part. Thanks, next slide. And the other thing, take advantage of the Cal Notify app. This is another way to be notified of an exposure using the Bluetooth technology. If you are positive, we'll be giving a code that goes into your phone. And then everyone who's been within that perimeter of contact will get a notification of exposure. If you then you will call COEM or you will call the student health team and we'll give you further guidance. So this is a helpful tool in our managing exposures. 
I think we're going to have a transition now, and Terry's going to help out here. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Sosha. So as you mentioned, next up, we're going to hear um, from the return to campus side of things, vaccine policy side of things, from Terry Winbush, Senior Director of Labor Relations and Employer Relations. So Terry, it's all you. Thank you, Hallie, and thank you, Angela. So uh, many of you uh, would like to know some return to campus updates. So uh, first thing, uh, you should know that the um, UC provided emergency paid sick leave um, has been extended through June 30th of uh, next year. Uh, so the allotment of the, the amount of leave, the 80 hours has not been increased. However, the ability to use it has been extended through uh, June 30th of next year. Once we have final de details on any revisions to this paid leave, uh, we will make sure that they're on the website and communicate it out uh, broadly to you all. Additionally, uh, the Office of the President uh, extended the um, vacation overmax allowance for policy covered employees to uh, be able to use their vacation accruals through June 30th of 2022. I am sharing that information to you because that has been changed. However, please take vacation. Please take time to refresh yourself. Please take that time because it's beneficial for you your mental health, your physical health, and all those things. But it's also a beneficial to your work. It's beneficial to your colleagues to have a, a more rested and refreshed, um, better version of you. So please take the time off uh, to take care of yourself. As it relates to uh, the return to campus, uh, that is still happening for a number of units who have been uh, phasing in their return to on-site. So please remember that we have the resources on Blink uh, for the return to campus checklist. Um, make sure people are updating their work location status form. So if you have not updated your work location status um, since July, you need to go and make that update. If your work location status has changed, even though you've changed it since July, you need to go and make that change. You need to always make that change when something changes with your work location uh, to make sure that that's always up to date. Additionally, there is information on Blink about the flexible work arrangement policy and guidelines, uh, information about training and professional development that we are offering, uh, as well as the fact that we've uh, added additional offerings for supervisors and managers um, to be able to give more opportunity for them to engage in the return to campus training, because we know that not all of them were able to attend um, our first several sessions. And so we are uh, still um, rolling out content to make sure everybody has the information needed for this. The other key thing is if you have temp employees in your area, temp employees through TES, um, make sure that you're including them in your communications around return to campus because they're working in your department. So they would work with your department on um, their work arrangement on when your department is returning to on-site if they've been uh, hybrid or remote. So make sure that you're including them in those communications. Next slide. So this is a key uh, component of what Angela was talking about earlier. So we know that um, at least 88% of our campus employees are fully vaccinated, but we only have consent for uh, and compliance for approximately 82 to 84%. So we have to close that gap because there could be someone who hasn't consented to share their information in my chart and they haven't submitted an exemption or deferral. And that means they're not compliant. And we don't want to discipline anyone if we can avoid it. The goal is for everyone to be in compliance. So if you look on the screen, the top square means you haven't completed your consent. So you may be looking in your my chart messages and you're like, Terry, I did this. I'm done. No, no, you're not. You have simply opened the message, but you have not completed the process. So you need to click on that message. Look, click on the subject header Click on one of those words, consent to share COVID vaccine information. Click there, it will take you to another page. On that other page, it will have information for you to review and then you can decide whether you want to consent to share your information and you say, yes, I approve. And then after you click, yes, I approve, you have to then click submit and then you are done. And then when you go back and look at your messages, if you've completed that process, your consent to share COVID vaccine information will have a green check mark so see the difference between the top and the bottom. 
And some of you are probably thinking, why is she baby stepping this for us? You would not believe how many folks don't see the differentiation between the two checkboxes. So we want to make sure it's very clear because we don't want to continue sending out these sort of, um, hey, heads up, you haven't been compliant with the process. Hey, heads up, when you think you've done something and you feel like you've been targeted. We don't want to target you. We just also don't want to discipline or get to the point of firing anyone when it's just a function of getting in compliance. And that is by either um, giving consent uh, uh, for your uh, vaccine status or by submitting your exemption and deferral and then responding to Cedric's request. So the other thing we communicated about last week, and I know we got a lot of reactions from a lot of folks, you know, why am I getting this message? I've done everything that I was supposed to do. Well, a number of people received communications from Cedric where Cedric gave them their file number. They did not reply to Cedric's message. Instead, they sent Cedric a separate message with a separate subject heading. And in some cases said on the subject heading here or documents and didn't include any further information for Cedric to be able to identify them as someone they'd already communicated with uh, for an exemption or deferral. So that delay is processing time. And that means when we get the updated list from Cedric on where people are in the process, you don't show compliant. So that's why you're getting communications from us. It's key that you follow their instructions to the letter by replying to the email, by uploading the documents as they tell you, by submitting it in the form they tell you. If they need a PDF, you have to send a PDF. You can't send a picture. You have to send it the way they need it because they are processing thousands of requests. Just our location alone has more than a thousand requests. So if you can imagine up and down the system, every single location but one is using Sedgwick, they really need you to follow those instructions for timely processing. Um, so please don't get frustrated with our messages. Just know we really, really, really just want to do everything we can to get compliance before we get to the point next week of sending out notices of non-compliance that are followed in the uh, flow chart and the policy that then lead to discipline. We don't want to go there. Um, the other thing for supervisors is there's the supervisor dashboard. Supervisors should be checking this dashboard every single day. So this is another way for a supervisor to interface with their HR to find out exactly what should be communicated to an employee and then communicate that to the employee so they're getting it wrapped up in a circle so they know exactly what they need to do to make sure they get compliant with the policy if they're showing is not compliant. If you aren't on the on a, on a UC San Diego worksite, make sure you're on VPN if uh, you're having connection issues. You have to be uh, VPN in order to connect to the supervisor dashboard. But it is key to look at that. What we uh, built into the dashboard uh, includes your symptom screening uh, or the symptom screening for your, your staff. So for those of you who get sick of looking for the emails on the symptom screening and how folks are doing, you can actually see symptom screening in the supervisor dashboard and sort of at a glance to make it very simple for everyone interfacing with it. We're trying our very best to make this process as simple as possible. But again, our, we're gonna ex exert as much effort as we can on the front end through this week to try and get as many people compliant as possible. Uh, and then next week, we'll actually start issuing the notices of uh, non-compliance uh, to, to do that final push. Because like I said, we don't want anyone to um, end up losing their job over not having um, engaged in this process. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Hallie and thank you all for listening. All right, thanks a bunch, Terry. Next up, we're going to hear from Executive Director of Transportation Services, Josh Kavanaugh, for an update on the light rail and some other transportation topics. So, Josh, it's all you. Great. Thanks so much, Hallie. It's great to be with you all today, and, and boy, has it been an exciting couple of years on campus. We've been working uh, furiously on the campus transformation and really putting our strategic plan as a campus into action, and, and we're seeing the physical manifestation of, of that across the campus. So in the campus strategic plan, we set three goals for the campus transportation. That our campus would be a destination. Um, that everything we do is going to be about enriching the student experience and that our built environment um, helps to spark research and, and innovation. 
So when you work with an operational guy like me, then we have, you need to translate that into to sort of actionable items. And the way that that translates for us is the idea of activating and enlivening the, the campus. This idea that we're going to become mixed use and have transit oriented development, great public spaces, um, really building out the um, housing capacity on the, the campus. Um, we want to make sure that we have a healthy and sustainable campus, and, and boy, have we appreciated the university's commitment to that over the last year and a half. And so um, that, of course, plays out uh, in the context of COVID with creating great open spaces where we can meet and be together and collaborate without being in an indoor environment. But it's also about prioritizing pedestrians on campus, um, encouraging active transportation, making sure that this natural beauty that we have across the um, UC San Diego campus is preserved and, and that we really find the balance in there that in, allows everybody on campus to enjoy uh, that experience every day. And then, of course, strengthening our programmatic relationships on, on campus. These are the ways that, that we help folks uh, through the built-in environment and through the uh, program of the university to engage in collaboration, to help create uh, uh, and innovate. And uh, we'll talk just a little bit more about um, some of the ways that these translate then into action. Next slide, please. So this is a great project, and, and I was delighted to get to be a part of it. This happened last week during the Triton Weeks of Welcome or T-Wow. And if you recognize this space, this is across from the Student Services uh, building, sort of an unused lawn space along Rupertus Way. And we gathered to put the three principles into action. We wanted to activate and enliven the, the campus to create a healthy, sustainable space and to strengthen programmatic relationships. And so campus planning, transportation services, student affairs through TWOW um, collaborated to invite students out um, to theme and, and create paint this um, outdoor furnishing. And I was over at the lawn today and my goodness, that place was hopping. Every table was full, every chair was full and people were there, whether it was relaxing or studying or simply being with their friends and, and colleagues who they haven't been able to be with over the last year and a half. Um, and it was a really vibrant space in a place that had not been very well used before. This is what the campus transformation is all about and how we create um, these spaces that are really anchored in those three principles. Next slide, please. So now let's take a look at how the campus transformation, the arrival of the UC San Diego Blue Line trolley are reshaping University Center. And can we roll the video? So as we enter campus here, we're looking up Gilman Drive now and beneath the guideway for the trolley, you see that beautiful new park that we'll be constructing over the next year, year and a half or so. We're coming up to the trolley platform. You've got Camp Snoopy on the left, Pepper, uh, the village of Pepper Canyon on the east. And we're turning now to look up uh, Rupertus Way at Anne Hamilton uh, piece. And we just started laying the basalt pavers for that last week. We're now pivoting around to look to the Epstein family amphitheater. That will be in place to welcome uh, everyone back to campus next fall. And I'm so excited for the opening season uh, there at the amphitheater. We just had our first concrete uh, pour for the amphitheater by the, the way. I'm spinning around now to come back down uh, Rupertus. That Ann Hamilton piece will extend all the way from the trolley station out to Russell Lane. And we're looking through now again to Pepper Canyon Housing and to uh, Warren Field. So um, Concordance, that piece by Ann Hamilton will be completed at the end of uh, spring quarter, at which point we'll be able to reopen Rupertus Way and have that perfect connectivity between the light rail station opening November 21st uh, on campus and University Center. So let's look at some of the, the ways then in which the arrival of, of light rail paired with the overall campus transformation is uh, really catalyzing the building program on the, the campus and the re-envisioning of, of what our campus can be. So Innovation Lane, uh, which is the pickup drop off uh, area with shuttles to support the central campus station, um, formerly Pepper Canyon Lane, that'll be completed late this year. And so we're actually already using it um, with our shuttles today and um, it will be fully operationalized um, for first rider November 21st. 
Then the Epstein Family uh, Amphitheater, that will be um, on, or I'm sorry, the Pepper Canyon uh, improvements uh, where we're um, re-greening the canyon and then working on construction of that park canyon into January of 22 and then park over the following year. The Warren Field restoration is underway. Um, that will be complete to where the, the turf is really taken in mid-February. Rupertus Way opening at the end of winter quarter, uh, so spring quarter opening uh, for that, and then the Epstein Family Amphitheater, uh, which will have its opening season uh, starting with fall quarter of 2022. Next slide, please. So um, as the campus continues to change, right, um, it gets a little bit more difficult. For those of you who are just coming back to campus after having been away 18 months, it looks just a little bit different out there. And then for our guests who are coming in from the, the community, now that we've got that people pipeline in the form of, of light rail, um, we need to give them new and, and better ways to, to find their way around the campus. And so um, we're doing this both with some tactical moves and some long-term strategic moves. Tactically, we're adding graphical signage to our construction fences that provide some interpretation, for example, about that Ann Hamilton uh, installation with concordance, um, and also providing supplemental wayfinding and campus information. Um, at the light rail stations, both at the Central Campus Station and the UC San Diego Health uh, Station on um, the East Campus, we'll have all the standard MTS signage, including real-time arrival information for the trolleys. So we're also, though, adding digital signage like the one you see on the right. And so this is, on this screen, looking very similar to uh, some of the box signs that you see around the campus that help with wayfinding. But these are interactive touchscreen kiosks. And so um, when you come up and you tap it, you can uh, see a campus map. You can zoom in to navigate. You can search in the, the map. You'll see a curated event feed of things that are happening near you. Um, you'll see attractions or or points of interest that are available near you. And of course, near and dear to my heart, you're gonna see transportation information on there, uh, real-time bus arrival information, including our very own Triton Transit. So another exciting project um, is the Waypoints project. And you'll see down in the lower left-hand corner there, one of our interns who worked on the project, Tommy Young, scanning uh, one of the 250 Waypoints that have been installed around the campus. And so we completed the central campus installation. We're starting on the East Campus and, and Scripps Campus right now. And these are really simple interventions, but I think they're really meaningful. It's a, a sticker. Um, you'll find them on light poles throughout the campus. It's got a QR code on that. And when you scan that QR code with your phone, it does a couple of things. The first thing it does is it opens the campus map, but it does more than give you a map. It actually centers the map on the point where you're standing on the campus so that you can put yourself in context on the campus. The next thing it does is it opens a dialogue that shows you some of the resources that are available around you. It tells you what campus neighborhood you're in. It tells you about the food options that are available uh, near you and actually links out to some of those dining uh, areas. Um, it gives information about how to get around campus, some of the transportation options that are there. Um, it gives information about buildings and services that are nearby. And it also gives you information about the wonderful public art that we have uh, on campus in the Stewart Collection and beyond, um, and helps you find your way to those pieces. We think this is a great um, gap filler, if you will, in the, the campus wayfinding system, which addresses those big moves, but hasn't historically helped people anchor themselves in context. And again, I love it as a student-driven uh, project. Tommy, along with one of our other interns, um, took this from a twinkle in, in my eye to a fully articulated project over the course of the summer. Next slide, please. So a little bit more about uh, transportation then. And so at the Pepper Canyon, uh, or I'm sorry, Central Campus uh, Station, our UC San Diego shuttles from Triton Transit will be uh, supporting that. Right now, we've got the Regents shuttle dropping off in there, but the loop shuttles bi-directionally will be operating in Pepper Canyon um, beginning November 21st for first rider. And we'll really be using this as our first and last mile connections to get people around the whole of the campus so that every 
everybody on campus can enjoy what light rail is, is bringing. And when I say everybody, I mean everybody. Now the East Campus uh, for Health got the, the station, we've got the Central uh, Campus Station, but we've also modified the SIO shuttle so that it comes all the way to University Center, giving the Scripps community a one seat ride and a short walking connection to light rail as well. So we've, um, we're in the process right now. I was actually just out and visited the construction site this morning for a passenger load zone um, on Russell Lane. And so we're doing a new turnaround on Russell Lane and that serves two purposes. One is it gives a place for the lifts and the Ubers and even just your spouse dropping you off or a roommate dropping you off um, to be able to um, drop off in the heart of, of the campus. Um, it also supports connections to light rail via Rupert as way. The other thing that that turnaround does though is it helps start to pedestrianize um, the university center. And so university center has been very car dominated. Um, we're taking it back for pedestrians, especially as Rupertus reopens in the spring. And we have this massive amount of people that are flowing back and forth between light rail and university center. Um, we wanna make sure that that is a welcoming and safe um, pedestrian environment. And this turnaround is an important part of that. In the temporary condition, we've restriped Rupertus uh, way to two-wing traffic to make sure that people can still access vital things in the university center while that turnaround is being constructed. And then we're doing improvements all along the Voight corridor for um, bicycles, for pedestrians. Um, we've added permanent, uh, or we've added temporary lighting in there. We have permanent lighting coming later this year and at the beginning of 2022. We've got improved buffered bike lanes throughout there. We're actually getting protected bikeways on the Voight overcrossing for the first time ever, which is something that I'm just giddy uh, about. Um, and then the Voight roundabout, our first roundabout on campus opened earlier uh, this year. And we've got the permanent signage that's coming in there that'll help make that a very intuitive um, space for uh, folks as they navigate it um, in the Void corridor. Next slide, please. So finally, I want to address safety and, and security because having the trolley come to campus is certainly a, a change of condition. And understandably, I've heard some anxiety on campus about that. And I got, I got to tell you, um, I couldn't be happier to welcome uh, Acting Chief Gregory Murphy uh, back to uh, UC San Diego Police. Um, we're thrilled to have him back with us. And one of the first things he did as he landed on campus was establish a really great working relationship with his counterpart in the MTS security uh, function. So we've got security cameras that are shared by both agencies um, at the stations. Um, we've got gates. We're actually the only two light rail stations in the entire network that have gates on them um, because we've got some adventurous people here on campus. Let's, you know, own it. And we want to make sure that nobody's getting onto those tracks uh, overnight when um, the trains aren't, aren't running. Um, we've got an MTS security team that's assigned to the campus uh, station, UTC uh, stations as well, and they'll be randomly riding back and forth as well to make sure that not only the off-board uh, environment at the stations, but the on-board environment for our trolley riders are safe as, uh, safe as well. So um, the two agencies work together really, really well. Um, and so UCPD is going to be available to respond to law enforcement needs as they're called into the dispatch center. Um, they're in real time communication between the agencies and they're collaborating on an ongoing basis. And so what we see at First Rider um, is going to be a great, robust, safe environment, um, but it is only going to get better. And that is something uh, that I really appreciate the commitment of, of Chief Murphy and his counterpart uh, to. And so with that, back to you, Hallie. All right, Josh, that is like so much ex exciting stuff going on. So thank you so much for sharing all those details. So for our last update, before we move into q and I'd like to invite Jen Bowser, Chair of the Staff Association to share some uh, info about some upcoming fun events for staff to get involved in. So Jen, it's all you. Thank you, Hallie. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here today. Twice a year, the Chancellor and the Staff Association host appreciation events to celebrate the wonderful contributions of our staff. Typically, these events occur over the summer and the holidays. In keeping with the tradition, we kicked off the staff summer celebration in mid-August by hosting an event at Dirty Birds for more than 100 night staff, and then the following day, we held a trivia session. A couple of weeks ago, we hosted our final cabinet conversation, which was with the chancellor, 
If you missed that, you can find the recording on our website soon. That same week, we also hosted a virtual uh, craft demo with Craft Center Manager Annika Nelson, where participants made thank you cards for their colleagues. We have some other fun activities planned in the upcoming weeks, starting with Triton Treats, uh, and specifically cold brew and donuts for staff on Tuesday, October 12th. We do have time and locations listed here, but we're still working on those details, so stay tuned for more information. But later that afternoon, we'll be hosting another virtual trivia session. If you have not attended one of these uh, of ours before, they're super fun and we have prizes for the top point scorers. Thursday the 14th, we'll be passing out ice cream bars in Town Square starting at one. And then we'll round out that week with virtual lunchtime karaoke on Friday. We'll have gifts for those who participate. And so if singing isn't your jam, that's okay. Just come watch your colleagues belt it out and have some fun. Uh, on behalf of the entire staff association, I'd like to say that we are all looking forward to reuniting with our fellow staff members. And that is the meaning behind the theme of this year's celebration reunited. You can visit the staff association's website or you can follow us on social at UCSD staff for, for more information. Um, next slide. And the fun doesn't stop there. We will conclude our summer staff celebration with events we have planned during homecoming week that are just for staff. So in conjunction with the grand opening of North Torrey Pines Living and Learning Neighborhood, staff can pick up a game card on Tuesday, October 19th from 1130 to one and visit booths around the neighborhood to collect stamps and win prizes. Uh, a staff favorite has been taking virtual photo booth pictures with their colleagues. So you can schedule a time on Wednesday, October 12th from 12 to one and show your Triton spirit for homecoming week. And then stop by the staff association table at the October 21st women's soccer game. And then the homecoming tailgate on the 23rd to pick up free swag. Um, this year is the 25th anniversary of the Triton 5K, although it will be virtual, there are many teams that you can join, so visit the Homecoming website to find a team and more information about all of the events planned during Homecoming Week. Thanks, Hallie. Back to you. All right, thank you so much, Jen. Lots of fun stuff coming back, and it's exciting to be able to start to sprinkle in some of these, some virtual events and some in-person um, treat distribution, so that's great. So I'd now like to invite, um, we're gonna move into our Q&A. So I'd like to invite our panelists uh, back on screen to, to answer some questions. And as a reminder, I really I would encourage you to check out the Q&A at the bottom. There's lots of great questions getting answered in writing and you might find one of your own questions in there and, and get some information. So check that out. So this first question, I'm gonna send over to Chip and I just wanna read it verbatim because I just agree with a, a part of it. So uh, can Dr. Schooley talk about the new variants, Lambda and Mu, the new Lambda and Mu variants in our community? And this person notes his updates are better than the news. And I have to agree with that. So Chip, what can you tell us about these variants? Uh, they've been noted and uh, the Mu variant kind of peaked in June and seems to be gradually declining. Uh, it's um, uh, like the Lambda variant, a little bit less susceptible to immunity induced by the vaccines we're using, but still quite susceptible uh, to the um, Pfizer and Moderna and Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So they haven't uh, jumped the track, uh, these three in terms of immunity. And they don't grow as well as the Delta variant. So they're having trouble competing with Delta. Uh, we're obviously gonna keep an eye on uh, this. We don't wanna have a variant that grows better than Delta, but is less susceptible to vaccines. Um, so that um, that would be, if I were the virus, the direction I'd go. Uh, but the less we let the virus grow by having more and more of us vaccinated, the less chance it'll have to play around and look for uh, an out like that. Yeah, it's a good reminder. Thank you, Chip. All right, so this next question, I think might have a couple answers. So the question is, if you do not have COVID-19, but do have a common cold, should you stay home? Can you work from home or should you take leave? So I'm wondering, maybe Angela, if you wanna to speak to common cold symptoms, right? They're pretty similar to some of the COVID symptoms. So how might somebody deal with that? And then maybe Terry follow up in terms of kind of the employment side, what would this person do? Yeah, no, it's tough because the, we've seen that often, particularly in vaccinated individuals and even the unvaccinated, the onset of COVID can be very mild and sometimes it stays that mild and it can look like a cold. It can look like allergies. So if they are new symptoms, the best thing to do is stay home and get a COVID test and then see how you do over and then, you know, you'll get your results back and you'll have a sense 
colds usually start to resolve fairly quickly. So we'd rather you stay at home, try and work if you're feeling well enough to work, keep working, let your supervisor know the situation, but get a COVID test rather than coming to work. Um, what we've got to all do is be willing. Sometimes we have a history of we want to work hard. We don't want to leave work for others. So we come to work sick. This is not the time to do that. You can do a lot more disservice and it could be COVID just subtly looking like a cold. So please test, stay home. Terry, you may want to add uh, how they. Yeah, I just want to amplify everything that Angela said. If you are not feeling well, look, <laughs> this was the case pre-COVID, but I cannot emphasize this enough in these times and forever in the rest of your future. If you are not feeling well, a cold can be contagious. Don't bring it and share it among your friends. That's not the kind of sharing that we learned in kindergarten. That's not what we're looking for, although we probably shared a lot of colds in kindergarten. That's not the point. Don't come to work. Do not come. Please do not come. Please do not come. Please go get a COVID test. Please isolate from folks until you know uh, what you have. Now, as, as it relates to leaves that may be available to you, um, when you um, uh, take your COVID test, there may be a number of things. Uh, if you are COVID positive or if you've had an exposure or something like that, you may be uh, able to avail yourself of the, um, the emergency paid sick leave, the 2021 leave that is available. You may also be able to utilize your sick time, uh, your vacation time. You, we, we want you offsite. So we are going to figure out a way to have you protected to the greatest extent possible. There is still Cal OSHA leave. So don't forget that if you have COVID symptoms and you are required to stay home, but you are otherwise able and well enough to work, but maybe you don't have work that is uh, remote work, then you would be eligible for Cal OSHA leave for up to 10 days. So don't think that I've got to come in because I've got to make sure I'm earning enough money for my family, that thereby putting everyone at work at risk, and maybe even your family members, because you have now, you know, left the confines of the room in your home. So please, please do not come in if you are sick. Do not. Good reminder. Thank you, Terry. All right, Josh, here's a question for you. How do you think the Mid-Coast Trolley Extension will change the staff experience at UC San Diego? And another question tacked onto that that I can remind you about if you ask the first one is, will the Hillcrest shuttle remain in service after the trolley is running? Fantastic. Um, we'll start with the Hillcrest uh, shuttle question. And, um, you know, yes, but uh, I think is the answer to, to that one. We're going to take all of those buses and all of the service hours that we've got in that program, and we're going to redeploy them uh, to, to where it makes sense to serve the Hillcrest uh, community. So the wonderful thing about light rail, and this gets to, to how it's gonna change the staff experience, is light rail doesn't get stuck in traffic. Unfortunately, all of those Hillcrest buses get stuck in traffic all the time. And so um, it doesn't make any sense to run duplicative uh, service that really isn't competitive um, with the, the trolley from a speed and reliability standpoint. So what we're going to do is we're going to take all of that Hillcrest uh, shuttle service and we're going to redeploy it in a continuous circulator between the Old Town Transit Station, Washington Street Station, and, and the Hillcrest campus. What that means is instead of having 30-minute connectivity, which is what folks have right now with the Hillcrest campus in La Jolla, we're going to have 15-minute connectivity where we can have a bus meeting every trolley that's coming back and, and forth uh, from La Jolla. So much more capacity, so much more speed and, and reliability for folks. Now, I, I hear a few minds, uh, gears turning out, out there, but wait a minute, uh, the, the shuttle is free and the trolley isn't. Um, well, the trolley is going to be to get us started at least. Um, we're really delighted to be able to sponsor the first three months of transit ridership for anybody that joins our Fast Pass program. Some people are joining right now and, and jumping on the bus. Others are, are going to hold on and wait until November, and I totally get that. But your first three months of transit access, 100% uh, supported by transportation services. After that, we've got kind of a step down, but at the very worst, you're going to get 25% off of the retail uh, rate um, because of our negotiated relationship with MTS. Awesome. Thank you, Josh. And thank you for the uh, advocating, I think, for these good things for staff in terms of transportation. That's awesome. 
All right, Jen, question for you. So you shared all this great information about upcoming staff association stuff. So um, this person says, how can we get connected to the staff community and meet more people? I imagine there's folks who maybe started their roles here with UC San Diego over the past year and a half, some people working on site, some people working at home. So how do people get tapped into the staff association? It's a great question. Thank you. Um, so you can always go to the, the staff association's website um, or email us at staffassociation at ucsc.edu. We do have um, many committees, uh, one hopefully that is of interest to you that you could join. Um, and I mentioned all these events that we're planning and we can always use volunteers for that. <laughs> um, and I think maybe some staff don't know that we also have affiliate groups. So these groups have um, particular interest that they focus on. And so um, the one that I've been involved with since I began as a staff member at UC San Diego was the Staff Sustainability Network. Um, but we have 10 in total. So you can go check those out. They have pages on Blink, but they're also linked on our Staff Association website as well. Awesome. I'll also know you can start an affiliate group too. So if you look at the list of affiliate groups and you see something that you would like to build community around as a staff member, we are totally open to staff uh, starting their own affiliate groups. So definitely point. And, uh, and keep an eye out for the monthly staff association newsletter. because That's where you can get tapped into a lot of these opportunities. Thank you. So now for a different subject, Chip, another question for you. This person wants to know, is there any danger in getting a booster? Why is there hesitancy to approve it? There are a couple of issues with it. One is um, the people who uh, generally look at uh, booster shots, think about it as um, uh, trying to prevent you from getting seriously ill. Uh, and with this virus, so far the vaccines, even the Pfizer vaccine uh, in people who don't have underlying conditions um, keeps people from uh, not all the time, but most of the time uh, being hospitalized and almost prevents all the deaths, again, except in people with these underlying conditions. So they're saying right now they're doing pretty well. Uh, we still need to vaccinate uh, a lot of people who haven't been vaccinated at all, because they're the ones who really are at the greatest risk, as you saw the numbers I showed you, they're the ones in the ICU uh, who are getting sick and dying. Uh, and uh, we also have other parts of the world that haven't had access to these vaccines. And we need to make sure that these vaccines are available there too from the standpoint of uh, social justice and equity. The research about how they've been tolerated so far has looked really quite good. There's been very little evidence of any more reactivity than in the first two uh, injections that people had last spring. Uh, and the level of immunity you get uh, when you have this long a uh, delay between dose two and dose three uh, really goes to the ceiling in terms of protection. So from the medical perspective, very little has to say. A lot of it has to do with kind of philosophy about vaccine utilization. And finally, I would say people aren't sure if additional vaccinations will decrease the shedding of virus by people who are vaccinated and really decrease the risk of, of transmission uh, to others in the population. My gut feeling is that it will because we see such a difference in the rate at which virus is cleared in the vaccinated people who get infected compared to unvaccinated people, but that hasn't yet been formally chosen, uh, shown. So those are some of the things that kind of were discussed at these meetings last week. Very cool, thank you, Chip. Number of factors, it sounds like. So this is a question related to return to campus planning. So Terry, I'm gonna send this one this, uh, your way. This person asks, why are departments being given the freedom to decide whether or not to work on site versus remotely? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, I, the departments are most are best situated to know their operations and to know what work needs to be done on a day to day basis. Look, I know it's very frustrating for employees who feel like they know their job and they should be able to decide their work modality. But the the basic uh, answer is that the supervisors, the senior leaders, they're the ones who ultimately make the call. And for us employees who report up to them, we have to be okay with that because that's sort of the nature of work life, right? Like you have a boss, a boss makes a decision. You may like it, you may not like it, but ultimately it's their call. So the, the best approach might be instead of why do they get to make the decision? Instead, it might be how can I help to keep them informed in their decision making so they know that we've come up with these great new ideas on how to engage with the people we serve, right? You may have come up with great, thoughtful, innovative ways to connect with folks that really have developed out a, a, a client uh, experience 
that no one really knows about because you haven't communicated with your leadership about that. Do it. You, they, they can't read your minds. They need to know what you thought of, what creativity you have. The other thing that people need to know and remember, there were a number of things that were uh, slowed down, stopped, or changed over the last year and a half in order to either shift operational response for the pandemic or just how we served our clients to be safe uh, in the face of everything that's going on. A number of those limitations can be lifted as the numbers have started to look really great on the pandemic front. We're not all the way there yet, but we are getting there. And so because of that, there are certain things that we may have stopped or slowed down that we can now ramp up again. And that might require some on-site presence. And you don't necessarily have to like it. You will have to do it though, if your supervisor requires it. And this is, I know, a really difficult thing for people who, I'm an adult, I should be in charge of my own life. Yes, and you also chose a job where someone else is your boss. And so unless you are the chancellor, someone is your supervisor on this campus and you need to follow what their uh, requirements are. But again, engage with them, talk with them about ideas that you might have. Don't just thumb your nose at the process and get frustrated and judgmental because there may be a number of factors that are going into their decisions that you have no awareness of because of their responsibilities uh, as leaders and supervisors. Sounds like communication is key with this question is my summation of your answer. Indeed. Okay. Um, Josh, so with more and more folks uh, coming back to campus, students moving in, you know, uh, employees gradually returning to on-site work, what is the one thing that you wish everyone knew about transportation on campus? If you could just oh, a takeaway. I've got to pick one. So uh, I'll give you two if you've got. <laughs> so um, the really big one is, is that you've got choices. Um, and um, I recognize that you know, everybody is in a different uh, situation and, and we have child care commitments or elder uh, care. We have spousal employment to consider. Folks live in different parts of, of town. And so we've tried to provide a diversity of, of options for getting to, from, and around the, the campus that can respond to each of those um, different uh, sets of needs and priorities that, that folks have. But beyond that, um, we've tried to make sure that whether it's in our daily parking uh, program or um, some of the new flexible transit options that are coming uh, from MTS, that we allow folks to make choices on a daily basis. Because I can tell you my situation in terms of childcare, for example, isn't the same day to day. And um, having that flexibility to drive when I need to, to drive and do a pickup after work and take the bus when I don't need to, to do that is incredibly helpful. So you don't need to be locked into a single decision either. We're here to help um, and to help you navigate the various options. And in addition, if you go to our website, we've got a, a reorganization of that and you'll find a new commute campus tab on there. And for our staff colleagues, um, you will find uh, uh, an item on that drop down menu for commute to campus that is just for you. And so it's got all staff centric um, transportation information. No more reading through things that are about students or things that are, are about faculty, even though we love both of those populations. Um, it, it is all about our um, staff and, and the things that are there to support you. All right, thank you, Josh. So I'm going to squeeze one more question in because I think this is just a really important one and a good one to leave things on. And so this question I'll throw to either Chip or Angela. So I'm just going to read it out here. Given the increasing risk of breakthrough infections, what do you recommend in terms of testing, masking, other me measures for fully vaccinated folks in general? So this person says, should we be masking outdoors? Should we be getting tested after dining out or going to events? So just kind of some of those life behaviors, what, what would you advice would you give to fully vaccinated folks? Uh, Dr. Sosha is the one who goes to restaurants much more often than I. She's much more rubanda vivant. So let me let her handle that. Oh, that, if that were only so true. But I think we all have to live life with being mindful of what we've been doing. So if you've been, in, if you're going to a crowded situation, a lot of folks, even if it's outdoors, put a mask on, right? Be safer that way. 
when you're traveling airports big spaces like that a lot of people make sure you have a really good mask that's where i think they n95 and kn95 a really good mask is a good idea because it can be a lot of people and often it's crowding occurs in those settings after a trip like that test test when you get back test five or six days and stay on top of your symptoms if you're going to go visit someone in your world who they're very vulnerable an elderly person maybe test before you go to see that person because you're going to know you're going to be around them and you want to really take care of the people you love so this is great that the campus has made testing so accessible and free they're around these vending machines we are stocking them every day testing thousands of people we are ready we can absorb thousands of tests every single day so if it crosses your mind you may have been exposed you know, or not exposed in a setting that a little more vulnerability, just grab a test, get a test five days later, you know, just take care of yourself and pay attention to symptoms. I think that's the best we can do. And then take the use those masks, use them a lot. You know, you're going moving around outdoors, you're going to malls, you're going grocery store shopping, wear a mask, it's easy enough to do. Take the times when you're having your mask off to those you know, you're around and that they're taking care of themselves. That's the way I'm trying to live. It's it's not a perfect world. We all may eventually, you know, we we'll have some vulnerabilities, but it's the way to get back to living. Very practical advice. Thank you, Angela. So with that, I'm going to wrap things up today. I want to share the details of another upcoming town hall before we do. So if you have questions related to events and event planning and you want to hear the latest news on that, you can join us um, at our events town hall. That's going to be on October 5th at 2.30 p.m. So we'd really encourage you to join us for that. You can uh, find the registration link at returntolearn.ucsd.edu. Um, you can find a recording of today's event on that same website. Um, so just thank you for being here. Extra thank you to all our panelists for sharing your expertise and we hope to see you next time. Thanks so much.